Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Zonis, and I am president of the Interfaith Council of New Canaan. And on behalf of the council, I want to welcome you to tonight's program on religion and the environment. We would very much have liked to have been in person tonight, um, but given the challenges of a pandemic and a nor'easter, we are very grateful to have the turnout that we do. And we're, we're so happy that you took the time to show up tonight and join us. I want to thank our distinguished moderators and all our panelists for taking the time out of their hectic schedules to join us tonight and to share their perspectives with us. And I especially would like to thank Aaron Leftland and his team at the New Canaan Land Trust for conceiving this important program and taking the time to put together a panel that truly reflects a diversity of faith perspectives on such an essential topic as the stewardship of our environment. At the Interfaith Council of New Canaan, our mission is to promote dialogue between faith-based organizations, uh, as well as the New Canaan community at large. And we always seek out opportunities to help address community concerns and make visible diverse uh, viewpoints on many topics um, for discussion and consideration in the community. So I thank Aaron for giving us this opportunity to be a sponsor. And without further ado, let me pass it over to Aaron Leflin of the New Canaan Land Trust. Thank you. Thanks, Jen, and thank you all for joining us. I'm so thrilled to welcome you and to be joined by our esteemed lecturers and panelists. This evening's program promises to teach us about our faith and our neighbors' faiths, to consider our responsibility in caring for the planet, and to inspire us to think and act both locally and globally. As Jen mentioned, my name is Aaron Leflin, and I'm the executive director of the New Canaan Land Trust. For those not familiar with the Land Trust, we're a nonprofit that works to protect and care for open space in New Canaan. In our 55 year history, we've conserved nearly 400 acres of open space in town, and we welcome the public to join us on our trails through volunteering, internships, and by attending events like this one. Tonight, we're joined by hundreds of people who share the Land Trust's passion for protecting the earth and all of its inhabitants. We invite you to share your questions and ideas in the question and answer feature. Please use that instead of the chat window because things get a little bit lost there. And we also hope that you'll consider how we can continue this dialogue about faith and the environment after tonight's program ends. To get us started, I'm pleased to introduce Drs. Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm, professors at the Yale School of Environment Divinity, Yale, and the Yale Divinity School. Together, they direct the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology, which arose from 10 conferences they organized at Harvard Centers for the Study of World Religions. Prior to that, they were students of Thomas B. collaborated over several decades to edit his books. Grimm and Tucker have written and edited a number of books, including a biography for Thomas Berry, Ecology and Religion, and the Routledge Handbook of Religion and Ecology. They are also editors for the series on ecology and justice from Orbis Books. Most recently, Grimm and Tucker have created six online courses titled Religions and Ecology, Restoring the Earth Community. They are freely available online through Coursera. So please join me in welcoming Mary Evelyn and John. Thank you so much, Aaron and Jen and all of our community uh, gathered here tonight. We're eager to share some of our ideas, but we know that there's many more that uh, you may have coming from uh, your own perspectives. And we're especially delighted that, uh, can, can you see the screen, by the way? Uh, not yet. Okay. Let's just try it again. We'll give it one more try here. There we go. Looks okay. good. Excellent. Good. good. <clears throat> so we're going to begin actually with a land statement that uh, John will read from, from Yale. We teach at the Yale School of the Environment and Yale Divinity School. And with Yale University, we acknowledge that uh, indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohican, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shagdaco, Golden Hill, Pawgusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquian speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationships that exist between these people and nations and this land. Uh, land statements are rather important for our acknowledgement of First Nations and prior peoples, but 
We also sense that they are ongoing processes. And so the work that we've undertaken, we see as putting land statements also into action. In that sense, we also want to clearly acknowledge that all of us attending are aware of the problems and promise of religion, that the problems extend into intolerance at times and forms of fundamentalism, the conflict generated by religions, and at times we see antipathy to science. But the promise is what we wanted to talk about today. The large numbers of people, over 85% committed to religious traditions, the power of texts and tradition, schools, seminaries, institutional space, and obviously the openness to science. In that sense, we wanted to emphasize that along with the religious institutions, we're all aware of this sense and idea of spirituality. And we're drawing on Ronald Dworkin's thought here, a NYU law professor who made this comment that a religious attitude involves moral and cosmic convictions beyond simply a belief in God, that people have an innate, inescapable, inescapable responsibility to make something valuable of their lives and that the natural universe is gloriously, mysteriously wonderful. That sense then of the spiritual engagement by the human with the natural world. So we want to begin with a broad notion of what is eco-spirituality. We're seeing it's an appreciation for the sacred universe out of which earth evolved. And it's valuing the complexity of earth and interdependence of all life systems. Eco-spirituality has a realization that human life emerged from the universe and the earth, and thus we are responsible for the continuity of the earth community. So that large scale perspective is where we want to begin. And of course, this is in part because Thomas Berry, our teacher, who many of you uh, may know of and read his books, inspired us in this direction. He called himself a geologian. He was a historian of all the world's religions and taught them at Fordham for years and years. We've pictured some of Thomas's books here. And uh, if we consider them, there are several seminal themes that emerge in his work. And uh, he also attended very closely to his idea of eco-spirituality. In this statement, he says, at its core, even our spirituality is earth-derived. The human and the earth are totally implicated, each in the other. If there is no spirituality in the earth, then there is no spirituality in ourselves. These key ideas then that we wanted to emphasize in this talk then drawing on Thomas Berry's sense of eco-spirituality is that we dwell in a sacred universe. We live, in an earth community. This phrase that Thomas Berry came up with is really central in this regard, that we are part of a communion of subjects. The universe is a communion of subjects, not simply a collection of objects. And finally, the great work of our times is to create a flourishing future for the earth community. Now we're gonna draw on these ideas to illustrate how the Western religions that are under uh, scrutiny today, um, draw on these same notions, sacred universe, earth community, communion of subjects, and the great work. We're beginning, of course, with Judaism and how the eco-spirituality of texts and traditions have flourished over time in Judaism. Of course, the universe, the sacred universe, is creation itself, um, and the creator God is a signal of personality in all of that. But the earth community can be seen as the rainbow covenant in the Hebrew scriptures uh, of humans with the divine for the future of all of life. A communion of subjects in the Jewish context is very much an I-thou relationship. Martin Buber, of course, was a great spokesman of this. And by the way, you can fill out um, other ways of speaking about each of these topics. It's just to give the broad sensibility. The great work for Judaism is certainly justice and mercy, which has influenced all of the Western traditions, still something we're striving towards, how to realize justice and mercy. Now, we wanna just give one example of 
Ecopeace Middle East, which actually brings together all of the Abrahamic traditions. And here's what it says on their homepage. We are Jordanian, Palestinian, and Israeli environmentalists working together to protect our water and our future. What they have done over a period of several decades is now begin to offer a green blue deal for the Middle East. And it's a bold initiative to advance climate security. They're inviting us all, of course, to uh, uh, add our voice, demand action from government leaders. They just presented this at the United Nations Security Council last week. Thomas Friedman has been a big supporter of, of this, the New York Times writer, um, and Gideon Bronberg, one of their leaders, has been a close friend, friend for many, many years. Now, eco-spirituality of Christianity, we can see it similarly, that the sacred universe is creation itself, that the earth community is the kingdom of God, or even the body of Christ, the communion of subjects is incarnation or logos, this inner ordering principle of all reality. And the great work is eco-justice, now shared by many of the traditions. And we're giving one example of green faith that's been based in New Jersey, but is now an international movement that's driven by compassion, love, and justice. They think of their theory of change as we're people of faith and conscience who have an irreplaceable role to play in working for climate and environmental justice. The green faith community is building a movement that is diverse, strong, and loving enough to transform our world. Fletcher Harper, of course, has been the leader of this uh, for many, many years. And it began within a Christian framework, but has become very much an interfaith movement. Now, the eco-spirituality of Islam, again, the sacred universe is something that's infused with unity, tawid. The earth community is community itself of, of all of the life forms, including humans and plants, animals, and so on. The communion of subjects is a balance, mizan. The Islamic community, along with the United Nations Environment Program, has just released a statement on Mizan uh, that's very, very significant and will continue to, to be shaped and formed for an ethics for our time. The great work of Islam is very much a trusteeship, meaning that humans are trustees for the future of the planet. It's another word for stewardship, but I love this word, trusteeship. We think of ourselves as trustees for art institutions or churches and so on, but this is trusteeship for the whole earth community. Beautiful idea. And one of the great organizations that's based in the UK for many years is the Islamic Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Sciences, founded by our very dear friend, Faslam Khalid, who helped us with the Harvard conference some 25 years ago on Islam and ecology. He calls this a call to Muslims to live up to the responsibility as guardians or trustees. And he cites this passage from the Quran, but trustees of Allah's creation and to work toward leaving a livable earth for future generations. So valuing nature then is not just for human use, it's eco-spiritual values and ethics from the world's religions, from mystical traditions, and nature spirituality. So a broad source we're beginning to draw on to say nature isn't just for our use alone. This past 25 years, we've been working on this project on world religions and ecology, and we've seen it scaled up to the point now where religious institutions are joining with land trust to talk about this. It's a marvelous thing to see, and we see positions opening up in universities. So what we have undertaken in these decades is to recognize that this, there's a sense of a field that has developed in the educational world, religion and ecology, and uh, understanding what religions contribute and what eco-spirituality looks like. Along with that, a force, action in the world, religious environmentalism, where this is found implemented and in specific projects. If we talk about the force of eco-justice, it's obvious that humans and nature are interconnected. And so justice extends both ways. So when we see the destruction of healthy ecosystems, the forests, fisheries, rivers, and wetlands are themselves 
uh, damaged, they deteriorate, so also human communities are suffering from pollution and climate change disasters seen in floods, fires, and droughts. So we have one of the most important examples of bringing together eco-spirituality and eco-justice in the Pope's encyclical that came out some six years ago now, Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home. Bill McKibben, one of the leading environmentalists of our time, considers this the most important document of the 21st century. That's a big statement from someone who founded uh, 350.org and now Third Act, one of our great environmentalists. But the Pope has brought together cry of the earth and cry of the poor in this uh, document. Now, the field within academia we are saying that science and policy are necessary, but not sufficient to understand the environment. And eco-spirituality and eco-justice are valuable new additions. I just wanna say, as John was talking about the pollution and so we're living on the Long Island Sound and that has been cleaned up over a long time, but these organizations like Save the Sound and trust uh, organizations like Aaron's these are very important to, to create healthy communities uh, of water and land. And I just wanna also underscore, we were brought to Yale because Gus Beth, one of the great policy people, uh, founded NRDC, founded World Resources Institute, head of United Nations uh, Development Program, said the science and policy can't do it. We need religion, philosophy, arts, and culture. So that was the opportunity uh, some 16 years ago when he brought us here. Now the force then for change in society is this protection of the sacred earth community. We've got to reinvent and re-own that word sacred earth community. Uh, but it, it's combined with the sense of resistance with eco-justice, but resilience with eco-spirituality because we're gonna burn out with so many of the issues. So we need this spiritual fruit, wisdom in the, the Buddhist traditions, wisdom and compassion come together with eco-justice and eco-spirituality. Now the People's Climate March uh, in 2014 was the largest march of its time uh, during the United Nations uh, meetings. And 400,000 people came out, but it was a particularly important moment because 10,000 religious leaders showed up. And we were marching with our students from Yale, but as religious leaders came down the side of one of the West Side uh, streets, the whole march had to stop to allow that many religious leaders to come forward. There's a big celebration in St. Pat in Saint, uh, the, the Saint John's Cathedral that night. Uh, up near Columbia and a whole conference around it. So it really lifted up this urgency of our moment, especially for climate change. Now we've just finished the Glasgow COP conference in November and most observers would say, of course, there's so much to do with negotiations and there's problems and promise here, but what was so significant that was present was youth, Greta, of course, and many, many others was uh, religious leaders, as you can see here, an explosion of religious leaders and laity, the laity is hugely important, and indigenous peoples. And we're going to turn for a moment to reflect on their contributions. There's been a absolute uh, explosion of attendance of indigenous peoples and attention to indigenous peoples, their own sense of eco-spiritual visions and values. And, we can make some summary statements, uh, talk about respecting Mother Earth found in different ways in different indigenous traditions, a focus on water, air, wind, the sacred uh, kinship. All life is related as the Lakota people speak of mitako yasin and other sense of relationship in tradition. So the sense of kinship throughout the natural world my own studies with the native peoples in the in North American setting brought me in uh, initially to Anishinaabe peoples and then to the Crow people. And here are pictured uh, Violet Medicine Horse and Adam Birding Ground. And it was into their family that Mary Eva and I were adopted in the 1980s. Uh, I would undertake field work and study with uh, Adam and Violet over the years. And at one point, Violet said, uh, why don't we have a picture? Why don't we go outside and sit for a moment? And so 
uh, Violet uh, arranged this setting in which uh, they dressed in their peyote way, uh, and their ceremonial robes for the Native American church. So it reminds me also that among many indigenous peoples, there is not a sense of exclusive spirituality. Namely, these are people who are very traditional Crow, or as they call themselves, Apsaloke. They also use the English term Crow. They are traditional members of that people. They are members of the Native American church, and they were also members of the Baptist church. So that sense of moving traditions uh, and not exclusive, but inclusive, the sense of including spiritual ways. Uh, this is a, a picture of the ceremonial moment in the camp lodges or the teepees attending a major ceremonial called the Sundance in English. Here you can see picture uh, dimensions of Crow religiosity or their spiritual ways, their eco-spirituality, which would not appear uh, obvious to an outsider, the sense of uh, the teepee itself, habitat, as a spiritual focus, the surrounding kinship with the natural world and food, food as central to the feasting that will take place during the ceremonial. This is the ceremonial in which the crow build a lodge, which is a symbolic mirroring of the universe itself. And you'll notice on the center pole, the buffalo head, the stuffed buffalo head, the sense of the food uh, that fed the people. The crow literally have a uh, a herd of about 800 to 1,000 uh, buffalo now in the Bighorn Mountains, you can see in the distance there. This lodge then is the center of a ceremonial they call Ashkise Liswa, and we call it in English the Sundance. Liswa is dancing, and Ashkise is this cosmic lodge. So dancing in the cosmic lodge in order to renew the, the biodiversity, the ecosystems, the people in this world. So ceremonial life is accompanied then with a, a sense of the force that indigenous people have brought into the international community to recognize their sovereign voices. And these sovereign connections with land then are at the center of indigenous ways that have come forward in the protection of the world and these ways then have gained recognition in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and their uh, Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, the Anishinaabe people in Bemidji, Minnesota especially, are a rich resource for understanding where Indigenous resistance and protection is being undertaken. We know that this sense of uh, eco-spirituality then and eco-justice takes uh, shape when native people assert the sacredness of mother earth and all life. Their uh, religious environmentalism inspires protest and protection of nature. And we, we join when they uh, resist this injustice towards themselves and they invite participation in these environmental activities. We've seen it, the Standing Rock resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline, where the native peoples, the Hunkpapa Lakota peoples, described it as much more of protection than resistance. Their, their relationship with water is one of giving back by their activities to protect water. So again, defending the sacred universe by indigenous peoples. It's continued in Minnesota with the Anishinaabe leading of the protection of the waterways in Minnesota by resisting the Enbridge Line 3 oil pipeline. That continues to this day. We're also aware that uh, a copper mine planned in the boundary waters was halted. That was reversed by this administration and also Native people played a significant role in alliance with environmentalists there. We also want to just share that uh, there's been a huge initiative that started in 2017 called the uh, Interfaith Rainforest Initiative. It was started by the Norwegian government and the United Nations Environment Program, our forum, and others working on religious issues. Because it said, um, as the Norwegians realized, having spent literally over 12 years, something like $4 billion of rainforest protection, uh, they said, we can't do it without the peoples of the area. 
the indigenous voices. Uh, and so this initiative in the Congo and the Amazon and in Indonesia uh, has been very significant to say the, the peoples of this region, their values, their culture, their spiritual, spirituality matters. Uh, and initiatives have sprung up uh, all over. Now, the Pope in the spirit held the first of its kind of Vatican Amazonian Synod in 2019. I was at a prep conference for this at Georgetown, actually the year before. In the front row sat cardinals from Latin America, not in their red robes, um, just in their regular day clothes, listening to voices from across the Amazon saying, what is happening? We need your help. We need your protection. Uh, many of these people have been at risk for their lives um, across this region. So the Pope had a huge summit uh, synod on this issue. Now, my area has been more with the Asian religions, and that's because I went to Japan in 73, 74, knowing almost nothing about Asia, nothing about Japan. But it became very clear, even while I was there, the two thirds of the world's people are in Asia, that the rapid industrialization that was gonna happen and has happened over the last 50 years has brought major environmental challenges to the area. The health of land and people is suffering. Eco-spiritual and eco-justice responses are occurring, but not at scale. And the need then to create a future that is life supporting. Now, India and China alone with over a billion people each are changing the face of the planet. And that is a fact that Americans are still not fully aware of, but we need to understand the impact of Asia the Belt and Road Initiative is the, of the Chinese is the largest industrial project in human history, and we don't even know about it. It's all across Africa and the Middle East, um, industrial projects, which are environmentally very problematic. Now, when I went to Japan in 73, 74, here was Mount Fuji. Um, then with industrialization there, pollution arose, but they spread a lot of their polluting industries into Southeast Asia uh, and elsewhere. When I went to China in 85, here's Guilin. Um, but most of the rivers of China are terribly polluted. That's true in India as well. And we know the, the smog and so on interfering already with the Olympics in China. So the problems of industrialization, modernization have left environmental problems in their wake. Now, when I was in Japan, though, I began to be very interested in other ways of knowing, other worldviews. I studied Buddhism intensely. Uh, I began to understand a little bit about Confucianism, which is a political and educational system. This is one of the daimyo's castles uh, in, in the province of Hime Himeji. Here in the place where I taught, this is a uh, school. The whole of modern Japan uh, from the 17th century forward is deeply influenced by Confucianism, as is all of East Asia, which is why they have a very high level of educational system and high achievement. And that's a Confucian base, which says, as you educate yourself, you cultivate yourself to give back to a common good, to the larger society. Now, the other tradition, of course, that's there is Shinto, very much a nature-based religion, the aliveness of trees, of waterfalls, of mountains, of water, and so on. Very, very significant. So East Asian uh, eco-spiritual values are just very generally Buddhism, profound sense of interdependence of all life. Confucianism has this wonderful idea of qi, of the unifying life force. If you do qigong or tai chi, you understand the vivification, the vital force of qi. Taoism has the body of the cosmos and the human body identified. And that's why Chinese medicine draws on this healing sense of cosmos, earth, and human. And indigenous traditions across Asia, including Shinto, have this very special sense of the sacredness of nature. It was at the Harvard Center for the Study of World Religions that we initiated a conference series that uh, brought together of uh, uh, scholars and environmentalists from 10 traditions and from the years 1996 to 1998. We held these conferences then that resulted in a sequence of volumes which are still used in the field and are uh, focused uh, each on a particular tradition. We attempted to 
uh, bring the issues forward of not only the, the values and the action that these traditions, but also the sense of justice and eco-spirituality. So in the middle of this series that we uh, run at the uh, Orbis Books Press, you can see Leonardo Boff's Cry of the Earth and Cry of the Poor, which was central to Pope Francis's Laudato Si encyclical as well as books by Thomas Berry and the native authors are also included in this series. This uh, led to the establishment of the Forum on Religion and Ecology in 1998, when we had held a conference at the United Nations. This uh, work at Harvard then, as I said, resulted in the volumes, which we then carried forward to Yale when we moved the, the project there in 2006. And we've also made connections with the United Nations Environment Program and their Faith for Earth Program. As recent as 2020, we've uh, entered into projects with them. We maintain a website and also we have a joint degree program at the, a, uh, the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology has the joint degree program between the School of the Environment and the Divinity School. This website then is also a, way, a setting in which we articulate the ways in which the forum aims to assist science and policy in valuing the complexity and sacredness of the life's uh, ecosystems. This effort to bring religious values for a flourishing earth community then continues in this project. So we're gonna conclude just briefly with resources for the field and the force. As John just mentioned, we have a website about a thousand pages on it. Um, Tara Trapani maintains it. There's statements, there's scriptures, there's bibliographies. You can get a lot of information, but also the force. There's engaged projects. What's happening on the ground? Solar panels, food pantries, and so on. Uh, divestment and investment and an eco-justice hub, which uh, celebrates the movement of eco-justice out of religious communities. The newsletter that comes out monthly has publications and also, as I say, these projects and movements are identified. Uh, you can sign up to get this letter and you'll see what's happening all over North America, but in different parts of the world too. And as was mentioned by Aaron, we've just launched these free online courses uh, of world religions and ecology. And it includes then introduction to religion and ecology, indigenous religions and ecology, South Asian, East Asian, Western, and one on Christianity and ecology. So these are six weeks, but they can be six months and as long as you like, and they're free for audit. And we've been working on them for many, many years. So we'll hope that they'll be useful to your communities, your synagogues, your churches, uh, your temples. And um, to conclude then, the religions of the world and ecology are a field and a force for flourishing with eco-spiritual and eco-justice values. Education, schools, colleges, and seminaries are participating. They can do more, of course. Leadership and community outreach, such as uh, exemplified here in this, this project, uh, beginning and continuing forward, and resilience and inspiration. We need that from one another, because these are very challenging times. Uh, but hope is on the horizon, and I think the religious communities have an enormous amount to offer, and we're thrilled with this partnership with the Land Trust uh, in the New Canaan area. So thank you very much. Happy to take a few questions before the panel uh, starts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mary Evelyn and John. Um, as, as I mentioned, if folks want to enter some questions into the Q&A feature, that's the best way for us to kind of keep track of those. Um, so we'll give, excuse me, we'll give folks a, a minute or two and um, yeah. Okay. I'm seeing one that says, like to know more about your work and introduce students at the Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, formerly the Hartford Seminary, to the important work that you lead at at Yale and include a module of environmental ethics in my course of contemporary Islamic ethics. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Hussein. We're delighted. And this is why we're simply saying this is all online, open source. And I think you'll be able to get a lot of materials uh, for your courses. I, that's, that's our hope. You can have your students watch the online class, on uh, the sections on Islam and ecology. Um, and I think that that would be, then you can, organized discussions around it as well. 
Yes, and I'm thinking, Hossein, how uh, marvelous it is to bring students into the Quran and, and the encounter with that the particular exchange between Allah and the human, accepting the trust, and that wonderful moment when uh, the divine uh, hu humorously smiles at the foolishness of the human at taking on such a huge charge. It's wonderful to be with students as they see how texts come alive in these uh, environmental issues. And I believe our friend Ozdemir, um, Ibrahim Ozdemir, who's coming from Turkey to be at the uh, Hartford International University uh, soon this spring. We look forward to seeing him and maybe you as well. Yes. Someone's asked if this will be um, recorded and of course it is being recorded uh, right now. So you can watch it later or share it with your friends. And Pauline is asking, why do you say hope is on the horizon? <laughs> because as Jane Goodall says, there's no other choice. I hope you'll all take a look at her new book, uh, which is a book of hope. It's really quite extraordinary. And you know, if someone in her late 80s can be speaking almost every single day on these issues, I think we can as well. She had so many obstacles to her work of understanding chimps, that they were alive and sentient and so on, but she persisted. That book is marvelous. I could say a lot more, but John- And also, Pauline, I, I sense that uh, our, uh, our attention to this phrase, hope is on the horizon, is in response to the existentialist dilemma of the 20th century, who to cite Heidegger's phrase of being thrown into the world, and the sense of that thrownness, and uh, we did not choose where we were born, we did not choose our gender, that in the face of uh, the, the, the challenges and dilemmas that to confront us, we now see hope in these very challenges. Hope lies in this horizon in response to that thrownness of the 20th century existentialism. Yeah. Um, I want to, there's another question related to this, but I wanted to answer Virgil's, how do you compare or contrast creation spirituality of Matthew Fox and eco-spirituality? Thank you for that question. Yeah. Matt Fox has been someone we've known for many, many years, along with Brian Swim. So we consider that to be very um, compatible. We're, we're extending it to the other world's religions. He mostly worked with the Christian tradition, but he was a complete leader mm -hmm. in creation-centered spirituality and highlighted so many of the great mystics, Hildegard of Bingham and others. So we salute Matt and his work and we're in the same uh, lineage. lineage, I would say, because he was also very influenced by Thomas Berry. Um, how do you think we can foster resilience in the face of despair and loss in the Anthropocene for ourselves and for those without access to wilderness or nature, as you mentioned, urbanization? You know, over 50% of our human community of over 7 billion people are in cities. And if you look at the Washington Post's recent series of articles on African cities of millions and millions of people, and the cities in, in uh, India and China that we have seen, especially China, of over 30 cities of over a million people. In North America, we only have about 12, but these are cities of 30 million people. So I so appreciate your question. It's hugely important. Um, but when we go to China, we've shown Journey of the Universe there and so on. There's a deep interest as for all of us, how do we connect to the life-giving forces uh, around us? And the Chinese have created some of the most extraordinary gardens in the world, Zen gardens and so on. So it's a great question. It is, Emma. It's a very important question. And, and these traditions have so much to say in their history about their own resilience. My encounter with uh, First Nations people, especially Northern Plains, Anishinaabe and Crow, and in a winter dance ceremonial among Salish people in Washington state, I am continually amazed at how indigenous peoples have not only survived through all of the trauma that continues in their communities. We see it in the the attention now to the boarding school and the despair that they faced and the loss that they faced and still the resilience of indigenous communities. These are not the only holders of this resilience, but certainly they provide incredible examples as we together face these environmental issues going forward. And by the way, you know, I've been journaling for years 
about the questions that are coming forth between hope and despair, between empowerment and disempowerment. And especially, I really want to signal between those who have been marginalized in our communities, African Americans, Native Americans, Latinos, and so on, inner city. And I did a lot of work early on in civil rights and inner city issues. So I think we need to be hugely attentive to these kinds of inequities if we're going to build uh, eco-justice and eco-spiritual movements. Mm -hmm. And as some of you are saying, how do we get religious and spiritual leaders to integrate these messages? Um, you, we don't hear it in the pews, right? Or the temples or synagogues or mosques or churches. And that's why we're so thrilled that Stephanie Johnson, one of our students from Yale is going to be moderating the next panel with religious leaders right here in your community. And I know that we should probably end up here, even though there's more questions. Because well, the, the question yeah. on the role of women, women in yeah. saving the planet is ecofeminism has been so attentive to this issue, seeing the ways in which the planet has been treated and women have been also marginalized in many situations. So the recovery of voice, the sovereignty of women's voices again. Right. And some of you are agreeing there's no choice but to hope. I think women's voices are absolutely essential. When I came, when we came to the School of the Environment at Yale 16 years ago, there were no tenured women. The first two minority faculty were only hired two years ago. Think of what kind of signal that gives to our international students and our uh, diverse ethnic students. We have a long, long way to go. Um, and I do want to very much respond to the question on process theology. One of our deepest friends and colleagues is John Cobb from the Center for Process Studies, influenced by Whitehead. We're influenced by Teilhard de Chardin, and that's why we made the film Journey of the Universe, which we'd love to share with you and, and so on in a book and a series of conversations. But the Center for Process Studies and John Cobb's work is absolutely essential uh, to, to all of this. So maybe we should um, we should wind up because I'm I don't want to cut into all right final point here maybe John you jump in Where religious traditions both Abrahamic uh -huh. <laughs> and Asian often posit a soteriological goal cool. of transcending the world how do we reconcile this yeah. with the spirituality there great question it is a, it is a, such an interesting question because of the sense of the kingdom of uh, God or the heaven oriented uh, it read as uh, a transcendent vision. We also find this in South Asia, and the sense of a, a Kaivalya or a liberation out of this world. Perhaps in the East Asia and indigenous traditions, we find a strong em emphasis on the imminence of the sacred in the world. But as we we're trying to emphasize in this talk, all of the religious traditions have voices that have spoken very clearly about God's creation, the covenant of Noah, the rainbow covenant, and that sense of extending relationships with the world. So the transcendence question is to the fore. And I think part of the resilience that we are discovering is telling our story, telling the story of our encounter with African-American peoples and enslavement, telling the story of our encounter with indigenous people and in recovering the story, I think we begin to see again ways in which the transcendence imminence question is woven throughout these traditions. If the divine is not present here in the world, I don't know where it is. We live in some, one of the most beautiful states. We're so blessed, right? Uh, where you live, where we live over here in Woodbridge, that sense of imminence. This is what we're talking about, the sacred earth community, the communion of subjects, incarnation in Christianity, Shekinah in Judaism, the Sufi understanding of the vibrant aliveness of matter and nature itself. Rumi, one of the most famous poets in the world, sings of this all the time. This is part of what we need to recover, to sing, to ritualize, mm -hmm. to express our human sense of celebration. I want to end by saying, I see two um, people I think here, Anna Thurston and Sam King, two graduates of our program here at Yale, have done so much to help us. This next generation, especially with yes. these MOOCs, these online classes, this next generation is so inspiring to us, and I'm sure it will be to you as well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Mary Evelyn and John. That was a fascinating presentation. I'm sure 
there's so much more to be said and um, <clears throat> folks have been asking about the online resources so we'll be sure to share those links we're going to send out a follow-up email to anybody who registered with um, both the recording for the presentation as well as some information about the forum on religion and ecology and the Coursera courses um, and maybe some of the other things that we're, we're about to discuss so um, okay. that information will be forthcoming we'll send that out um, before we begin the panel discussion, we did think it would be fun to kind of see where everybody's tuning in from and maybe give an opportunity for some um, interactivity. So you should see a poll on your screen just asking where, where you're tuning in from or where you're residing. So if you want to just take a second and fill that in, we're, we're just curious to see where everybody's coming from. Um, and while that's uh, moving forward, um, I'll take the opportunity to introduce our uh, panel moderator. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce the Reverend Stephanie Johnson, who since 2017 has been the rector at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Riverside. She's a former student of Mary Evelyn and John's, having earned a Master's of Divinity and a Master of Sacred Theology at the Yale Divinity School. She's the co-author of A Life of Grace for the Whole World, which is a curriculum for children and adults on pastoral teaching on the environment. And she's also convened and facilitated many interfaith con conversations about programs, or conversations and programs about ecology, conservation, and the environment, similar to the one that we're going to have tonight. Um, joining Stephanie and for our panel discussions will be uh, the following local faith leaders. We have Dr. Kareem Adib, who is the board chair of the Interfaith Council of Southwestern Connecticut, as well as a part-time imam for the United Nations in New York. Reverend Elizabeth Garnsey of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan. Reverend Rod Canale of St. Aloysius Parish in New Canaan. Pastor Cliff Knett. I can never get this right. Sorry, Cliff, <laughs> actually, of uh, Grace Church here in New Canaan, uh, Rabbi J. Tel Rav of Temple Sinai in Stamford. Uh, and I think that's our full panel. Yes. So with that, uh, results of the polls. Oh, wow. From all over the place. This is terrific. Um, I think everybody can see those results, right? I'll end it. And with, oh, here we go. Share results. Sorry about that. Um, and with that done, I'll, I'll turn things over to Stephanie. So thanks so much. Hi. If uh, all the other panelists can unmute them uh, and show their videos, then I think we can see everybody on the screen. Excellent. Oh, technology is so wonderful. Um, thank you, Aaron, for hosting this, and thank you, Jen, for your introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I uh, have uh, known Mary Evelyn and John for 15 years. They've mentored me uh, in many ways. And you can see how empowering and hopeful and inspiring they are. Uh, and so so deep gratitude for their, their time and effort and how many folks they have changed their lives, including mine, um, uh, in, in this work and in this calling uh, to serve uh, God's creation and take care of God's earth in the language that I use. Um, the hope for the panel now is we have a series of questions. Um, we're going to start off with some uh, general conversations about scriptural influences from uh, the, the three faith traditions, recognizing, as John has pointed out in his presentation, and that we've talked about a little bit with Mary Evelyn, that there's so many other faith traditions we could have brought into this conversation. But for tonight, and hopefully it's the one of many, um, we are talking about um, the Islamic, Christian, and Judas, uh, Jew Jewish traditions and how they've of you care of creation. From there, we'll have a conversation about um, different theologies that uh, our wonderful panel um, experience and live into about caring for creation and eco justice. And then finally, towards the end, we're going to talk about some practicalities. What do they do in their congregations? How can you be inspired with hope and in your own communities to move forward? And um, hopefully, you'll walk away from this this wonderful evening with some ideas about what you can do in your local community, um, what your congregations can do and how you can inspire and support your own pastors um, in leading this, this effort. Um, and we'll get into that at the very end. But for now, um, my first question is for uh, uh, three of our panelists. Um, the question we've raised with them is to think about what is our scriptural history about the care of creation, about the creation? What is it about in scripture that the creation story resonates with you and 
encourages you to consider care of creation. Um, from the Genesis story, which we all share within our faith traditions or perhaps other creation stories that inspire us to care for creation. And so I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Rabbi Jay to jump in first. He has five minutes. It's, as I mentioned to Rabbi Jay before, this could be a five hour lecture on uh, Genesis and creation, um, but you have five minutes to give us, give us your shot on um, uh, your tradition and how you see the creation story. Um, Thanks, Stephanie. I really appreciate that. And I have a timer that I'm starting now because uh, oh, good. <laughs> otherwise I could go on and on. And I was going to jump up and down, but yeah, timer's good. <laughs> you go. Start your timer now. Begin. I'll do that. I, um, uh, I feel compelled to say that I'm a, little, I'm a little surprised that after two years of spending all my waking hours on uh, on Zoom. I still haven't figured out what kind of shirt I should wear, not to uh, not to let the the <laughs> weird patterns distract us along the way. Um, so I um I was uh, <laughs> it's funny Stephanie we couldn't have been clearer when she mentioned that this was a scriptural uh, examination, and yet as a Jew I I hear scripture and I start with a text that you know that is clearly at the beginning of our of our narrative but then it's our tradition to just leapfrog our way through uh other elements of our of our um our textual basis as the people of the book you know we 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 begin with text uh and that text continues to evolve and emerge and some would say it's ongoing revelation uh across the the entirety of our story uh, but what does change is our relationship to the texts. Even if the words are, are stable through the, the centuries, we read them differently uh, as, as we need them. And so um, in a Jewish um, uh, feeling or, or approach to text, there's no violation. If we return to a text like Genesis uh, that I've put up on the screen here, and we, we appropriate it and uh, and explain it in ways that they could not possibly have meant. Uh, so you'll see that I take a little bit of liberty along the way as I do just that. So I'm going to start with the the overarching statement that uh, Judaism and ecology today are spoken about from two um, two elements that that balance each other out and inspire. And those two would be gratitude mm -hmm. and responsibility. So when, when the story tells us that God placed man in the Garden of Eden, here down below, Elohim et ha'adam, v'gan eden le'ovda ule shomra, that um, the, the sovereign God took the human and placed him in the Garden of Eden, and here's that, that, that trigger text, to, to till it and to tend it. We weren't just there to lay around and eat all day and, and enjoy watching clouds. We were there for a purpose. But as we, we looked through the garden, of course, where our traditions teach us, it was exceedingly pleasant. And everywhere we looked, we took pleasure. And it was, uh, it was a great privilege. And when we feel that privilege, the next step ought to be responsibility. And what I love about the tradition is that that once we start there, uh, it certainly doesn't stop. I'm going to show you a, a small handful of texts as we make our way through these uh, traditions. This one is from a collection of texts known as Midrash, which is extra textual. It's uh, contemporary with the Torah, but it didn't make it into the canon, uh, but it's thought of as almost co-equal. So this is a commentary, uh, uh, a Midrash on Kohelet, which is Ecclesiastes. And it says, when God created the first human beings, God led them around the Garden of Eden and said, look at my works. Do you see how beautiful they are? How excellent. It was for your sake that I created them all. See to it that you do not spoil and destroy my world. And here's the key. For if you do, there will be no one else to repair it. Now, this is a powerful um, enlistment as partnership with God, that there is an, an incredible need and responsibility for one of the creations to realize that the responsibility rests upon them. There are all kinds of organisms across this globe that, uh, that benefit from the environment, but it's only us who has the, uh, the, the free will and the station in creation to, to do something with it. 
Uh, and so here's the next concept, and that is called Baal Tashchit. This is from Deuteronomy. It's a small step aside, and it says when you're in war against a city and you have to besiege it for a long time, and you're going to be building these uh, siege machines uh, to capture it, you must not destroy its trees. You can eat of those trees, but you can't cut them down. And here's the key. Are the trees of the field like humans who can withdraw before you into the besieged city? So the trees rely on us. You know, we are their, their caretakers. And this is the, the quintessential text about the human's responsibility not to abuse the planet. I'm going to move forward to another text. Uh, and this, again, just it, it emphasizes the responsibility we ought to feel about, uh, about our place here, that it's not just about me. It was about those who came before me and those who will come after me. Just as you found trees planted for you, so you must plant trees for your children. Now, everybody in the globe today understands the, the ecological crisis we're facing, and everybody understands what's good and what's right and what's wrong. But it's so easy to get distracted by all the, the privileges and comforts and opportunities that, that our modern society affords us. It's so, so easy to, to feel the need for or the, 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 the right to a personal vehicle that is comfortable and emits a huge carbon footprint. It's so easy for us to pursue wealth and to forget that there are significant implications in what that means. It's so easy for us to distract ourselves with other big ideas. And I'm going to finish with one final text because I think it's fabulous. It's one of my favorite texts of all the Jewish tradition I've come across. This is from a, another tradition of, um, of Midrash. The collection is called Avot de Rabbi Natan. And it's a story about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai who said, if you are holding a sapling in your hand and someone says to you, here comes the Messiah. He said, come, plant the sapling, and afterwards you can go and welcome the Messiah. Now, the reason I love that is because you might on one hand think that there could be nothing more important than the Messiah. And if you think along those lines, and the Messiah, by the way, the, the idols that accompany those kinds of concepts can be any sort of shape. If you think that, you're mistaken, because if you rush towards what you think is the goal, we will miss the opportunity to preserve this beautiful spinning blue globe, and uh, and our kids certainly will not have the chance to appreciate what we've been able to enjoy all the way along. Uh, I I didn't come very close to five minutes, not not in a, in a proportional sense, but I, I will yield my uh, my space. I'll say, Dibarti, I have spoken, and I'll pass the baton. Thank you so much. Rabbi, you'll have more time later on, but that was wonderful. And uh, I love the idea of holding the sapling. Um, and here comes the Messiah. Re what a powerful image to take away from, from your talk. Thank you so much. Dr. Adib, I wondered if you would jump in um, and talk a little bit about your scriptural influences on the care of creation. Sure. It's very hard to put me after Rabbi uh, <laughs> Jay, because it's quite a high goal to, to, to match, but I'll do my best within the five minutes. I would like to look at this problem from an angle of uh, pure religion. The purpose of creation in Islam is to worship God. In chapter 51, which is the dust scattering winds, wind that scatter dust, verse 56, God said, we have not created the jinns and the human beings to any end other than that may know and worship God. This is the purpose of creation. This worship is three-dimensional. In common language, worship requires us to excel in three types of relations. Mm. A relation with, with the divine in our tradition of five pillars of Islam. These are rituals. B, relation with self, good behavior. These are transactions. Third, relation with the universe. This requires mercy. And human beings, animals, plants, grass and trees, all things. In chapter 11, which is called verse 61, he 
God brought you into being out of the earth, which means out of organic substances and evolution, either directly or indirectly from the earth, and made you thrive there on. Thrive, if you consult the dictionary, it means prosper and develop vigorously. Mm. Develop vigorously. To build. What kind of building? Remembering God. Buildings and roads. Social services. Spreading knowledge. Treating the sick. Helping the needy, orphans, etc. The antonym of thrive is destroy. But a more holistic term is corrupt. Corrupt. Mm. And when God wanted to create that Adam, he spoke to him, he said, I'm going to create a trustee on earth. And the angel said, I'm going to create someone who has spread corruption and spilled blood on earth. And God said, I know what you don't know. And then he brought Adam and he taught him all the names and he brought him in front of the angels. Hmm. And they said to the angel, tell me the names of these things. They said, praise, do, praise be to you, O Lord. We don't know what you haven't told us. He said, Adam, tell them. And Adam told them, upon this, God asked the angels to prostrate to Adam as a sign of respect. Now prostration is a sign of worship. All of them didn't accept Satan. He asked Satan, why didn't we do it? Because I'm better than he is. I'm made out of fire. He's made out, out of earth. This is arrogance. Now, here, what we have to see is that Satan said, listen, this person, this being that you have honored, give me a chance, give me a respite to show him that he doesn't deserve this honor. I'm going to try to tempt him and show he doesn't deserve this honor because he's going to be ungrateful to you. We're seeing this in, any, in all aspects of life. The antonym of thrive is destroy, but a more holistic theme is corrupt. Corruption is defined in Islamic jurisprudence, in the jurisprudence of Islam. Trying hard to spread what destroys life and its sustainability, which is opposite of building destruction. So now I look at pollution, it's a destruction. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't like destruction on earth, doesn't like spilling of blood. We are really, this is what Islam teaches. And in this way, being kind to the environment is a must upon every Muslim. It's the duty of every Muslim to take care of the environment. Islamic beliefs, traditions, and values provide an effective and comprehensive solution to the current environmental challenges faced by the human race. Islam has a rich tradition of highlighting the importance of environmental protection and conservation of natural resources. According to Islamic law, the basic elements of nature, land, water, fire, forest, and light belong to all living things, not to just human beings, even to animals. We are, we are seeing right now that our cell phones are affecting the bees all animals, they have GPS in their brains, affecting them. And the Quran said, eat and drink, but waste not by excess. For Allah love, not the wasted. And what I would like to emphasize here is that being kind, protective of the environment is a type of worship in Islam. Let me say that the Prophet when he came to Medina, he recognized that natural resources should not be overexploited or abused in order to protect land, forest, and wildlife. This was 1,400 years ago. The Prophet created inviolable zones known as Haram and Hima. Haram is forbidden, Hima means protection, in which resources were to be left untouched. Haram areas were drawn up, up around wells and water sources to protect the groundwater from overpumping. It was in the desert. Mm -hmm. Hema applied to wildlife and forestry and designated an area of land where grazing and woodcutting was restricted 1,400 years ago. 
of certain animal species such as camels were protected. The Prophet peace upon him established a hima in the south of Medina and forbade hunting within a four mile radius and destruction of trees or plants within a 12 mile radius. The creation of inviolable zones shows the importance placed by our Prophet on sustainable use of natural resources and protection of wildlife. And it says, plant a tree if it is your last deed on earth. Plant a tree if it's- And I stop right there, you know, five minutes to give other people the chance to share their wisdom with us. Thank plant you. Plant a tree if it's your last deed on earth. Yes. There is another uh, statement. That if you plant a tree and a bird or animal eats from it, it's put in your deed, in your book of good deeds, because we believe that we have a spiritual account where our trespasses, our sins, and our good work are balanced on the day of judgment. It will go into your assets. We have assets and liability. To give you an example, somebody speaks ill of me in Islam, and don't, I don't reciprocate some of his good deeds as I would come to my spiritual account. Wow. Wow, I really love that. Thank you, Dr. D. That's really a powerful, a powerful point. Plant the tree if it's your last deed on earth. Thank you. And uh, Reverend Elizabeth, if you would uh, give us perspective on scriptural passages um, from your perspective. First, um, thank you to the rabbi and the, the imam. Those are incredible images, and it's uh, humbling to follow in both your, your wake on the screen. But thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I speak as an Episcopal priest um, here at New Canaan in St. Mark's. And, uh, you know, I, when I was posed this question, how does our shared scripture, scriptural history inform our care of creation? I love this, this question because my mind immediately went to um, which scriptures? And uh, I remembered St. Anthony of the Desert and, of course, Thomas Aquinas. You know, there are several um, early saints in our tradition who held that there are two books of scripture. One, obviously, is nature itself, and Mary Evelyn and John alluded to this already. Um, but the natural world, you know, is the first scripture, the first revelation of God. And Thomas Aquinas said, creation is the primary and most perfect revelation of the divine. And to make a mistake about the creation is to make a mistake about the creator. Um, and also in our, you know, in our Christian faith, that one of the distinguishing features of our, our you know, the bedrock um, basis of our faith is this idea of the incarnation of God. And we are very focused, you know, rightly so on in our faith uh, on the on the incarnation of God in Jesus, two thousand years ago in Bethlehem. But we take for granted that that that's that's it. And when in fact the incarnation begins, when the mind of God decides to self manifest and to create and to put matter into the void and and to say it is so and as Genesis so poetically puts it, and, and there was light. And then everything else that flowed is this manifestation, this incarnation of the divine uh, in creation. So the first incarnation, it, you know, the first revelation of God is in all, the, all that we see and all that we have, and, and humans come last. You know, all these things that have evolved over 14 billion years uh, are God at work in, in space and taking space. So, uh, you know, the, the, the written scriptures, our second Bible, um, t testifies to this. You know, the Book of Wisdom in our apocryphal scripture says, um, the studying, studying the grandeur and artistry, the beauty and the wisdom of nature, by doing that, we could recognize and contemplate by analogy the artist and the author of creation. Um, we have uh, one of my favorite scriptures in, in Genesis is Genesis 28, the wrestling of Jacob. Jacob wrestles with the angel and falls asleep on a stone pillow and uh, dreams of angels ascending and descending on a ladder between heaven and earth. And um, he wakes up and, and he says, you know, surely God is in this place and I did not know it. You know, and, and he, he's suddenly realizing 
you know, in my interpretation of this, that he's suddenly realizing that God isn't, you know, limited to the shrines and the tribal systems, but God is present right where he is out in this wilderness, you know, fleeing for his life and um, experiencing God present there with him. And he makes an altar out of that stone and to remember it. And, and I just love the idea that he's sort of waking up that, oh, God is everywhere, you know, even though it's, it's embedded already in their story that, that God has been moving and, uh, and present in, in nature. And, um, and then we, you know, just, I guess in that story, I'm reminded of, of what Mary Evelyn and John talked about in eco-spirituality that I think awe, you know, awe is really the primal religious experience that, that spurs somebody in to go search for God. And how many people say, well, I, I go, I find God in nature. Of course we do, you know, and I love, I love that people do, and that's awe. Um, and I think that that's maybe something that Jacob was experiencing was a sudden awe, you know, surrounded and, and met by God out in the wilderness. Um, and then of course, in the New Testament, we have Paul, even Paul saying in Romans 1, ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things God has made. Um, you know, even, even Paul, it was talking about the natural world and how, you know, ever since the beginning of creation, God has been, the, the word has been present and the Christ has been present. So, um, you know, the incarnation of Jesus is, is when it becomes human and becomes personal for us. And, uh, you know, so then we have the, the rest of the texts Christians read um, pointing to that and showing us the image of God in in the person of Jesus, but, um, you know, uh, certainly in the, the grand story unfold that was already unfolding for all these many eons. Um, so, and, and another um, point I just wanted to make is that the, there's a wonderful book by Ellen Davis, who's the Duke Divinity School professor. It's called Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture. It's, it's my third Bible, I must say. Um, it's a great, it's an agrarian reading of the scriptures, and she traces this relationship between the people uh, and the land, uh, how it correlates to their relationship with God, and, and the way they go in and out of harmony and disharmony with God. The land suffering or flourishing seems to follow their following God and, and staying loyal and faithful to God. So, you know, Genesis, when, when, the, when the woman and the man disobey the one command they're given, God says, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Um, you know, in Isaiah, there's all, and, and Hosea as well, there, there are images of the land languishing and mourning when the people have drifted and um, and when they come back, it flourishes again, and the waters overflow, and, and you know, milk and honey come forth. And um, so, it, you know, that's, you know, by contrast, the Psalms are filled with those images. There's Psalm 65, especially, when, when the people repent and are forgiven and restored with God. Um, the psalmist says, the pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hills gird themselves with joy, the meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Um, so I just, I just love that, uh, you know, the scripture, before there was written scripture, before the inventing of the printing press, people are, had much more direct experience of nature and, and were much more open to a direct experience of God and nature before the words on the page uh, sort of took us out of our bodies into our minds, you know, and, and gave this authoritative stamp to what was true and what wasn't. And, um, you know, we began to separate the creation from God and from ourselves. And I think that that's been a great decline, you know, ever since we've experienced a great decline in our ability to see God in nature in a way that people didn't dismiss as a woo-woo uh, fallacy for religious people. And 
so I'm so delighted to, to have heard this presentation tonight and you know, pulling back together all these traditions that have, have preserved that notion. And it's, it's embedded deeply in our own tradition, but we've lost sight of it. And um, so I do have hope too, because I think that there are many people recognizing the, the value of these kind of not lost, but marginalized traditions and silenced traditions. Um, so I'm looking forward to this echo spirituality taking its place alongside policy and uh, and science and not and not any longer you know getting into you know being siloed off as a as a hobby of certain you know small-minded or simple-minded people. I think it's always been the poets, poets, artists, and dreamers who inspire. Um, the hardworking people who make changes and 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 they have an important role to play. So um, our, as our cosmology can go back towards a much more um, transcendent, with feet on the ground, you know, doing work, I think that we're in for a, an exciting new age. I have tremendous hope in, in spite of all the, the very, very discouraging things going on in the world right now. But, you know, as we know, science, uh, the quantum physicists, the astronomers, the molecular biologists, they're all discovering our common, you know, our single source, uh, our single origin and celebrating that. And I think that um, it's something that has been known by people intuitively, right. in, you know, in the ancient times. Right. And, um, now it's being discovered with science. And so our, our medieval paradigms and this notion that, that the human race and the earth are at the center of the universe has been very clearly displaced and upended. And, and um, it's hard for people of faith en masse to be willing to relinquish that and, and to put in place a new cosmology that recognizes that we're in a galaxy, one of billions of galaxies off on right. the edge, while you know orbiting one star that is one of a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. Right. And, yeah. You know, we have to remember that we're not at the center. Yeah. So. Thank you, Elizabeth, Reverend Elizabeth. I, I I love the idea of the Psalms and the the whole creation scene, praising God. I mean, that's a, such a good reminder. The the psalm that you brought out, that the scriptures tell us that it's not just us who worship God, but all of creation is brought forth. And then in the incarnation, you know, for Christians, that the man has been made flesh into the earth, flesh being such a powerful transcendent word for us. Um, so thank you for all the scriptural insights. I really appreciate it. We're going to jump into sort of a conversation about what inspires um, the rest of our panel to, you can jump in with scriptural reflections too, if you'd like, but if, I the question that I had posed for um, Pastor Knickel, Knick, sorry. Um, and, I'm sorry. That's just fine. You're doing well. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't get to meet you in person in practice. And also for um, Father Father Rob uh, was, what is what is it in your congregation, your faith tradition, that the theology that motivates care for creation? Mary Evelyn and John talked about eco justice. We heard about gratitude. Uh, uh, Reverend Elizabeth brought in awe. Um, we talked about stewardship, brokenness or sinfulness. Maybe the counting of deeds. Um, just different ways. What is it in your traditions that is a motivating? That maybe not just one theology, but what is it that? that compels you or encourages you uh, to move forward in care of creation and responding to the climate crisis. Um, and I'll start with um, Father Rob first. Sure, thank you. Well, um, the Catholics are, we're famous for our, our saints and we have a saint for almost every day. <laughs> and, <laughs> so the saint for today, speaking about the important role of women is, um, Bridget of Ireland, or sometimes called Bridget mm. of Kildare. And uh, she, uh, one of the, uh, her, her feast comes at this important moment for the earth and the, and the world, um, the universe, is that it is the midpoint between uh, winter 
and the vernal equinox. So we're halfway through. And as I said to the congregation this morning at the service, you know, at mass, um, for what it's worth, we're, we're halfway through winter, you know, congratulations. We've just come off a, nor a nor'easter and so forth and so on. But what Bridget does is really uses uh, nature and um, the earth. And, uh, you know, we situate her in Ireland with just the beautiful countryside and uh, a lot of spirituality derives from environment. As Elizabeth suggested with Anthony of the Desert, for example, that, that location uh, evokes uh, a presence of God that's informed by the surroundings and the ascetic nature of the desert or the, the awe that can come from looking at the, the beauty of nature uh, says that, that God is there. God is there, as, as uh, Mary Evelyn suggested toward the end of her presentation. And I think too, for, for our, the Catholic tradition derives from everything we've heard today uh, so far on the panel. It's tough being kind of at the end here, but it's just beautiful because I just kept nodding my head saying, yes, yes, yes. So also in, in the Genesis story of creation, the comment is, and God saw that it was good. Uh, and, you know, you, 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 it, for the all that we have for God and say, well, if God saw that it was good, it A, must be good and B, it shall be protected and embraced and loved by uh, uh, we who are also part of God's creation. And so the, the, I, I always, I've always loved the idea that God laid out all of the rest of creation and then created humanity so that we could see it, enjoy it, live in it, till it, tend it, and so forth. Um, and then that leads to uh, another Psalm, I, I, 139, where humanity says, I am fearfully, wonderfully, beautifully made. And I, I, that echoes what's something that we heard about from Thomas Berry at the very beginning of the presentation, that sense of being caught up in that mystery of God doing this. So yes, Laudato Si was a, a pivotal document in the life of the Catholic Church and the Amazonian Synod as well, what the Pope is doing. And in Laudato Si, he draws from a number of sources, including scripture, but also from liberation theology, the mm -hmm. idea of uh, who are we as humans placed where we are uh, by a loving God who has, as we hear in Jeremiah, great desires for us, right? So, and gives us all of this land. And so really what I think uh, uh, Pope Francis is saying is, you know, it's all relational. It really is all relational. The whole story of creation is God desiring to be in relationship with humanity and everything else is just this, not just a beautiful background, but a part of it. And so we see again, a rich spirituality that derives from the experience of the earth. When we, you know, when we go on retreat, where do we go? I go to the ocean. I go to any body of water and I am instantly transmitted, trans, transported rather to a God who is hopefully transmitting to me uh, what, you know, what his will is uh, for me. And, and so I think really, uh, you know, Francis spends a lot of time um, explaining what, what does it mean to be a good steward? And it, again, I love the idea of the word uh, trustee in Islam. Mm. It's, so, it's so powerful. And similarly, you know, we know what a good steward is. It can be overused. It can be used in the context of fundraising, right? Oh my goodness gracious, that's <laughs> so important, but here we go. And it's not so much, it, it's a type of behavior for sure, but it describes a mindset that is behind the behavior, right? So it's a sense of responsibility, which we've heard echo throughout the evening here uh, about the use of natural resources, to be thinking about what are the sources of pollution? Uh, the, what about just creation qua creation? Do we reflect on that? Do we meditate enough on that? And, and what do we do with waste? Where does it go? And what does that do? What kind of impact does it have on our natural world, which was so beautifully, wonderfully made by God? So this, you know, I think the Pope suggests uh, is a guide for, so it's about making choices, right? It's about making decisions. And isn't it true that all decisions are moral decisions, right? About what do we do 
do I, you know, literally, do I, do I take this piece of plastic and put it over here or do I put it over here when I am, you know, when I am done with it? And we, we are starting, you know, we teach children this and we integrate it into a sense of spirituality. This is God's creation. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up because, uh, and I love that idea of who's going to take care of it after you, who's going to tend to it. And, and so um, it really has, we, we try to make this connection as the Pope does between making those kinds of choices about the earth, the, in, the environment, the water, and um, is it not related to the way we make, uh, uh, how we impact, have an impact on one another, on one right. another. So it's, it's about how do we care? You know, the end of the day, we, we often say, <laughs> you know, is it, is it when we get before God, you know, in judgment, is it that thing I did or didn't do? No, it's really, really about how did you love? How did you love? And how did you love all that God created, right? So the, this is a, an important question. And so one other way to look at it, last part of my comment would be, you know, are, we are guests on this, on this beautiful earth that God has given us, right? And we have such a rich tradition of being uh, guests and being hospitable. And I think it's in one, Rabbi, I, I'm gonna mess this up, but it's in one of the rabbinic stories that I remember reading when I was in seminary about the, the tent of Abraham and Sarah that it, there's one story that uh, when they got up in the morning, right, they would open the entire, all the flaps on their tent. So the people could come from the north, from the south, from the east and the west. They wanted to, to receive them, to, be, to welcome them. And so they were amazing hosts, right? We see in, in uh, New Testament, uh, Martha, who is just a wonderful host to Jesus and, uh, and that, uh, that kind of hospitality. And Jesus has very specific things about if you're welcomed, you're welcome. If you're not welcome, move on, right? And do That's that. Right. Just keep That's dry, right. just brush, you know, the dust off and so forth and so on. So it is, you know, we're really good at taking care of people and, um, and animals and things in our lives. So why not the rest of, of the environment? Again, completely derived from the experience of God creating in Genesis and um, our tradition of the Catholic Church and the many documents that we have about caring for the earth that are related to uh, peacefulness and, uh, and justice and mercy and all of that. It's about relationship, what we care for the earth, we care for one another, caring for the earth a certain way is reflective of how we are going to care for one another. Um, yeah, amen. Amen, for sure. Um, thank you for that. And um, the, the image of, um, of relationship and love is so key to all of this, right? It's relationship and love of all things and love of God that compels us to go forward. Um, and uh, just really important uh, to hear that, that sense of, of tradition in the Catholic faith, how that inspires and how the Pope has been such a leader for all on that one moving forward. So thank you so much. Pastor Cliff. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, you're, you're up. You're the, <laughs> you can do scripture. You can do whatever you can do. The theology, you're, you're, uh, you're going to pull it out, pull it off, for, pull it all together. I'll, I'll do a wrap up and then we'll have one broad question about practicalities, but yeah. All right. Fair enough. Thank you, Stephanie. I think it's clear that Jesus said the most important command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbors yourself. I think it's clear that to love my neighbor means to work for the well-being of my neighbor. I think it's real clear that Jesus took food and fed hungry people, and he commanded his followers to take water and give it to thirsty people. In other words, he never minimized the physical. He did not draw drive a wedge between the physical and the spiritual. He insisted, as we read in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in Genesis 1.27, God created man and woman in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God created us with bodies and gave us this gorgeous earth to live on. And he created us for a purpose, to love God and to love each other and to show it in very practical ways. And then in uh, Genesis 3, we read about a fall. And it was not just a stubbing of the toe. It was a massive fall as human beings begin to rebel against God. 
I think it's fascinating that in Genesis 1 and 2, God calls human beings to join him in the creative enterprise. Be it Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. In other words, produce. In other words, join me in the creative enterprise. Mm -hmm. And yet obviously the fall introduces the issue of greed. And I have a lot of people come and talk with me about specific sins in their lives. Very rarely do I have anybody come to me and say, Cliff, I really struggle with greed. <laughs> and to be honest with you, greed is a real challenge in my life. And I think the fall introduces greed in a powerful mm -hmm. way. And I think we watch human beings abuse the planet as a result of pure, unadulterated greed. Mm -hmm. So, so much of what we do at Grace Community Church in New Canaan is seek to direct people to Christ to allow him, his Holy Spirit, to change their hearts, to change us from greedy people into people who use our intellect, use our careers, use our powers to make this world a better place. In other words, to use our power to leave the world better than when we arrived. And some people say to me, oh, Cliff, you're so spiritually minded, you're no earthly good. Well, I would challenge that. I have noticed that roads that do not lead to an important destination fall into disrepair. But roads that lead to an important destination are kept in good repair. If life leads only to death, why repair life? Why repair the road? But if life leads to eternal life in heaven, take good care of the road because the road is headed to a very important, very valuable destination. And so I think the scriptures are real clear from creation to the incarnation, and it has already been mentioned, to the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul repeatedly points out that the resurrection of Christ is not some spiritual illusion. He uses the words spiritual body, imperishable body, immortal body. And in spite of the fact that he uses different descriptive words, the word body is always there. And when Thomas has a trouble believing in Christ, he appears before Thomas and Jesus says right here, Thomas, put your hands into the nail prints in my hands, thrust your hand in the spear wound in my side, and Thomas stopped doubting and believed. Now, why does the New Testament emphasize that so much? I'm convinced because it was dealing partially with Gnosticism, which taught the physical is evil, and the God of Genesis 1 and 2 is evil when he creates the physical, and uh, the spiritual is good. And yet, I think it's real clear that from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible points out that both the spiritual and the physical, both the soul and the planet, both the spirit and earth are valuable because both have been created by God, and they are gifts from him. And therefore, leave the world better than when you arrived. Join God in the creative enterprise, and remember that the road of life does not lead to a fertilizer pit, ultimately. Remember that the road of life leads ultimately to heaven, which means it is very wise to take very good care of this earth. Thank you. That's so helpful, the physicality of, of Jesus's time on earth and, and all of the things that Jesus experienced and the relationship to feeding people and, and the call that we have, that shared call. And I just wanna say, how wonderful and how blessed it is to hear all of you speak and all say such similar things from all different traditions. And yet, yet at the end of the day, it's about God, God's love, the beauty and gift of creation and what we are given today in the abundance of it and how in the future we're supposed to, how we're supposed to leave it for future generations. It totally reflects what Mary Evelyn and John have been working on. Um, it reflects all of our faith traditions. And in a world that's so divided, how fabulous to be in this space to celebrate what we share and a shared mission in God's name. I mean, think about the power of this space for God, not, not greed or self-aggrandizement or anything else, but the power that we have for God's future in this space. And so what I want to ask you in the next few minutes, we are going to try to get some questions from the group. Um, is what is it 
with all of this abundance and this loving gift of power and and possibility and hope that Mary Evelyn has always encouraged us for, what is it that we can do as a community of faith locally to, to share this? Or what is it you're doing in your communities that you wanna collaborate on? I think one of the things that Aaron and I had spoken about was how do we make this not only a fabulous evening, but a fabulous seed that we've planted, a tree as our deed from here going forth, a little sapling. And so I'm going to throw it out. You can unmute yourself and we can just toss it over. You can raise your hand just like this, old-fashioned hand raising, <laughs> not the mechanical stuff. Raise your hand, throw it out. And we can, we have about, believe it or not, I keep saying five minutes. Uh, we have about seven minutes to get through this and then we're going to open up for questions. Okay, we want to hear from the people who are, who are here. All right, Dr. Adib, what can we do? How can we be hopeful? Let, share me, let me, as an engineer, draw a uh, picture of the, spirituality. It's a cone. The higher you go in it, the higher you go you climb it, the more you find out that the next person to you is going toward the same goal. Mm. At the bottom of the cone, I guess I can see it by Jay or Mark Lingle or Elizabeth or Cliff or Father Rob. I can see them one at the bottom of it. Now as we as we climb upward, this section becomes close and close and close. Suddenly we see each other. We were taking different paths toward the same goal to pleasing God and to his, um, what he's asked us to do. And if we get closer enough, we can hold hands and lift the whole communities together. We need to get close enough. Yeah, I think that's so important. Thank you. Rabbi? Yeah, I thank you. Um, I love that. Dr. Adib, thank you for saying that. Uh, and, and, and you're right, Stephanie, we're all... We're all saying a lot of the same things, but there was a question that popped up that Virgil uh, put in the Q&A, and I don't know if everyone here is able to see the Q&A, but we are. And he asked about how liberation theology is such a powerful message and delivery vehicle for life affirming and um, an inspiring uh, uh, inspiration for, for people in the third world. Uh, and he wondered in his question, if maybe some of this eco spirituality can provide uh, a, a, a vehicle for the same degree of inspiration uh, to liberate the first world, and I, I do feel like it's a, an important thing to mention that, uh, as Dr. Adib said, all of us here are talking around the same issues, and the higher we get in the the level of discourse, the closer we get to each other. But we, on this call, just by virtue of the fact that we have access to uh, the, to broadband internet and, and first world technology and, and the, the um, discretionary privilege of time to sit in the evening and relax with ideas. Uh, this is a pretty privileged conversation. And so I love the idea that in this world where we've got so many, so many distractions, uh, the greed, Cliff, I couldn't agree with you more. That's just such a, a major element. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is a wonderful language that speaks to people in our world. Uh, you know, we have the, um, the, the opportunity to invest ourselves in something which is so obviously um, of dire importance. And in doing so, we liberate ourselves. Uh, we, we get back so much more than, uh, than we put in. Yeah, I think, I think that there is a sense of liberation and, um, and, and in, we're sort of, we're, if we look at a, a part of, we're part of that process, we are part of the new, the new creation is the words I would use. This new possibility of, of liberation, and and I want to I want to pose a question because you're all preachers um, that was raised earlier, and I've been doing this for a time, and I can tell you that it's not that easy to preach about climate change or care of creation or stewardship. And I saw someone said, "Well, how do we how do we encourage our pastors to do that? Where do we where do we support that effort?" You know, um, uh, and and I think because we some things have been politicized um it's a challenge and so i wonder if you all um if you have all um experienced that or how often do you preach or do you have, do you do those sorts of lessons in education for your congregations and if there can be collaboration about that i think 
we have good examples of, in our, at least in the, in the Christian tradition, the, the examples of the saints who started with nature. And, you know, St. Francis was enraptured with the creation and called, you know, brother, sun, sister, moon, sister, wind and fire. I mean, he so embraced all the elements of the earth that I think in preaching, I, I try to draw upon nature. I'm no St. Francis on any level, but I, I, I like that idea of just um, embracing nature as, as an instrument of learning. And, um, you know, I've taken some classes in sustainability and one of my favorites was biomimicry and how nature has so much to teach us just in the basic laws that you can observe in any ecosystem, that nature doesn't waste anything. You know, most of its energy comes from sunlight. It recycles everything. There's no waste that's not given a purpose. Um, you know, it, it, it thrives on cooperation and, and diversity and shared cooperation between mm -hmm. species. You know, there's so many lessons to learn from just the ecosystems. and. Uh, you know, given that humans understand ourselves as the stewards of creation, we're really the only ones that can mess it up and that do mess it up, you know, with our waste and our right. disproportionate use of things and imbalances and greed. So I, I, in preaching, I think one thing I, I like to do is not so much um, draw, you know, point to policy and all that kind of stuff as much as inspire by... Right loving the creation and letting letting people be inspired by nature which is like what they all say you know i find god in nature me too you know i think we all can and that it's something to to really open that door again and not that it's not being done but more so and make a point of it that this is yeah. not a contradiction you know god doesn't live in this building right uh, god lives when we walk in if we bring god in there he is you know whatever one, one of the, thank you, one of the blessings in our congregation, if you could say the pandemic was, we have a very large meadow and for six months we worshiped every single Sunday outside, except one Sunday when it rained. And we sat through every season and we sat in the spring, we sat in the heat and humidity, we sat in the fall as the leaves changed and they would, they literally fell on us one day and we sat um, out there when it got freezing cold and it was 40 below for Christmas. I mean, not 40 below, 40 degrees. And then we had snow on Christmas a year ago. And so the people in my congregation experienced God and that relationship in ways that was so transformative. Um, and those are the sorts of things I think we can all, we can all share. Um, I'm thinking we have uh, Time for a couple of questions. If anybody else on the panel has something pressing, otherwise I'm gonna to go to the questions. Um, uh, this has been amazing. I know Aaron wants to say a few words. Um, so the question is, what makes the earth keeping principles found in the Bible stand out from the rest of ideas, theories and solutions pertaining to environmental conservation? And then part of it is how do we work in tandem with environmentalists who have different religious belief systems? Pantheist, Gaia worships, um, how do we work in tandem? And I think it's such an important question, Nisa, because the, the reality is, is that we need all of us on board. Mary Evelyn has told me, every time you meet somebody who wants to talk about it, you bring them on board because you can never let anybody go if they wanna do this ministry. Um, and so um, uh, what would be your answer about working in tandem with other groups and how do you celebrate their, their own their ways of being? Anybody have a response there? Dr. Deep? Uh, let me unmute. You're good. Okay. Uh, we, I think the best thing to do is to emphasize personal responsibility. That's mm -hmm. very important. We ask governments to do this and uh, states to do that ourselves. We have mm -hmm. to be responsible. Give an example. If everybody have good kids, we don't need social services. Everybody cleans in front of their homes. We don't need the, the town to come and clean the houses and what have you. It's personal responsibility and, and emphasizing we're not on this earth to make money and to, uh, to have more stocks and more property. We're going to meet our creator. He's going to ask us what we have done on this earth. 
We have in a you know, are a three-dimensional being. We're not a biological machine. We are. We have a heart. We have a mind. We are three-dimensional. We we have we are biological like animals, but we have a brain. We have a heart. And unfortunately, we have developed our bodies to the point that we are living longer. Our brains, our knowledge has increased a lot with the internet, everything at the tip of our fingers. Our spirituality has not grown in comparison at the same rate. Mm. And this is the core of the issue. When I go and give and deliver sermons at the mosque, you and everywhere else or on Zoom, I emphasize that, that you have to give the spiritual part of your life an attention. And part of it is be kind to others, help them, the environment, the water, don't pollute the water, don't do this, don't do that. That's that's what is that. That's what we we should do as leaders in our yes. community because they listen to us. We have to present it in a way that is attractive to them. We show them they can benefit from it. Because if you raise your kids very well, they get to a school where most of the kids are not raised. The way you raise them, it's gonna affect them. So it's our common good to start with ourselves. And then, thank you. Our common good is it transcends all sorts of labels, right? And, and definitions and restrictions. And it unites us when we think about the common good, whatever language we use or however, however we describe the divine, it brings us together. And I think that's a really helpful reflection on that. Um, another point, uh, so if did anybody wanna talk about uh, the other groups? Otherwise, the other question was, how do we bring in the arts? Uh, my friend, Steve McCausland just posted, um, what is it, how is it the arts and other ways, music, um, celebration and joy in your traditions that might bring you uh, closer to caring for creation or you know, encourage you and support you in, in, in those ways? I don't know if anybody's tried anything like that. Well, art, art or... and music are good tools. It's how we use them. It's how we use right. them. We need music that is uh, soft, that has melody, much more than drums and beat and what have you, that, that, that uh, disturbs you. Uh, we need the uh, words in the music also. The art also is unbelievable. You can, with a painting, you can do a lot of things. You can convey a lot of ideas. And... Um, all of us have to work together. You know, the, uh, the artist, uh, the movie pro producer, the who write plays, those who make songs, those who write books. I mean, we have to have a common goal of improving our state because we are really falling as far as humanity. Look at the 21st century compared to the 20th. You're going, we're going downward. We have to, we have to really take this thing very seriously. Right. Environment, even, even moral environment, we're just, we're just dropping. And we have to really take it seriously and work together. And we're all, we all come from Adam. You know, Can anybody tell me if Adam was Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Muslim? We have to think as brothers and sisters and humanity and hold right. hands and lift humanity with us. I, that's so true. And I, I Mary Evelyn and John's uh, movie, Journey of the Universe, which they did with Brian Swim, is some beautiful imagery and um, it invites you in to consider the divine through ways that, that are both um, visual and spiritual. And it sort of transcends all of that. So it's a beautiful opportunity for that sort of work. Um, there's one other question. I'm, I'm going to uh, take privilege of the moderator. Um, and say, how do you put these practices into your daily lives? And so I have a gratitude practice. Um, and I think there are spiritual practices of fasting, which means like cutting back on your resources. It can be considered in, in our tradition, we fast from certain things, um, maybe even for, from food or things, but you can use fasting. Meatless Monday could be a fast for, for not only your body, but also for the earth, or you can have a spiritual practice of, of awe, um, or I do a thing called it was a campaign I started years ago. My kids had their lights on all the time in the house. And I said, turn off the lights for God's sake. It was not so nicely said, turn off the lights for God's sakes when they were teenagers. And so now I turn off the lights for God's sake as a spiritual practice. And so I think if you can take all of your actions that you do and offer it up to God and develop it as a daily ritual, 
it can bring you closer to creation and to the creator. Um, and so that's sort of my daily practices. Um, turn off lights for God's sake. Um, recycle. I, I thank God for water when I turn the, the water on and I say, thank you, God, for the water. Just sort of getting closer to God can in, empower me and inspire me to move ahead. Um, it's. I have a, I have a oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just looking at the time. We got about another minute. I was just going to note that, um, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh died last week and he, he's so good on this topic that of just having a mindful way of life throughout the day that everything we do really is an opportunity to um, have awareness. And so how to put these practices into our daily lives, I feel like all the little things add up to a transformed consciousness where, right. you know, you can't really unsee the waste we're producing moment by moment or decision by decision. And if we begin to have a habit of asking, how will this impact um, the, the environment, but also my environment and my relationship to my resources. And um, it has a reverberating effect, I think, that can get very large when, when people do this in mass, but we can only do our own thing. Um, and I think as people of, of religious, in religious leadership, you know, we have a responsibility for buildings and um, planning and so on. And if we, if we continue to just factor in the, the economic cost to things, not just the dollar cost, uh, it becomes more of a way of life. Right. I think it has become a way of life. Um, a final question from our um, president of the land trust and rabbi is answering the question as far as I could see, how do we keep our hope up in this climate crisis and rather to go into despair and pessimism? Um, rabbi, I don't know. I'm sure you had words of wisdom. I didn't see your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see it. Did you type something? I, I do think when I when I answer it, it flips over to the answered tab. Uh, and oh, I love okay. Tom's question. And, and yeah, I, my response was along the lines of how easy it is in my personal nature to be pulled towards the the, the pessimistic side of seeing things and the despair. Um, but I've also learned through contemplative practice that that is um, what in some ways Judaism would call the yetzer hara, the, uh, the the strong dark inclination that can pull us in the wrong direction, uh, the yetzer hatov, uh, which is our our inclination towards the good, um, is a choice to some degree. And so, in contemplative practice, I found that I can push away the the feelings of despair and pessimism, and instead uh, really insist on and decide to focus on the, uh, the elements of optimism and that which gives us hope. And I mentioned my two little kids who I, I look at and I think about inheriting this world and, and uh, my God, if I stay in a place of darkness, uh, as I look at them, you know, what, what good can I possibly do? What good can they possibly do? Thank you. And on that note, I would say that I find hope and optimism in things like this, where we gather together and share our our love of God and love of creation and love of creator and our hope and inspiration that lies in people like you and all of the work that Mary Evelyn and John have done and land trusts that are preserving the land. So hope and optimism comes when we gather in God's name for the future and for the present. So on that note, um, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful panel. I'm sorry I couldn't meet you in person. I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron. I think we're to turn off our video. So he's gonna say one final word. Thank you for the land trust for organizing this. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie, and to, to all of our panelists for a <clears throat> just incredible, insightful, and, and, and beautiful discussion. Um, and of course, thank you to our, our speakers, Mary Evelyn and John. It was just a privilege, <clears throat> privilege getting to listen to you all. Um, excuse me, <clears> horse <throat> in my throat. Um, as I mentioned, we, we will be sending out the recording of this to everybody who, who registered, as well as some additional resources. But um, yeah, it's it's this has been an incredible evening. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I wish we could have gone for another five hours <laughs> just being able to listen to everybody and, and their thoughts and learn together. But um, unfortunately, that's not the case. But we'll wrap it up there. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and stay tuned with uh, with other programs coming from the Land Trust. Uh, our website's a great resource for for programs. Our newsletter as well. Um, but but stay in touch. We'd love to continue this dialogue with you all and and find ways to. Um, I forget who said it, use this as the seed, use this as a sapling for, for future growth. So um, with that, have a great evening and thank you all.